Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing today, and it is then posted onto our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those archived recordings. We both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think that might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, welcome. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, uh, similar to a you know state library in some other states. So we serve all types of libraries in the state. So you will find things on our show that are for uh, public libraries, K-12, academics, schools, universities, um, corrections, museums, anything that is a library or has something to do with libraries, <coughs> excuse me, could have something, a uh, topic on the show. So um, well, you can probably find something for anybody. <laughs> um, this is also, we've been doing Compass Live for about 10 years, so we have a pretty huge backlog of archives that you can watch as well. So definitely dig into those if you want to. Um, we do do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products we think may be of interest. Uh, sometimes we have shows that are more uh, Nebraska specific, things done by Nebraska Library Commission staff about services and products we offer from here. Uh, but sometimes we do bring in guest speakers. Um, and we have a guest speaker with us this morning. Um, but first I just do want to mention um, as far as what is happening with the COVID-19 and the pandemic going on, we are going to be continuing with our show. We are able to work remotely, as you can see both myself and the speaker. I'm in um, my office, he's at his, I work from home a lot. Uh, we are going to keep going every Wednesday morning with the show. On our Nebraska Library Commission website, I want to point out for our Nebraska libraries, we do have a post here um, that is uh, uh, pinned right to the top of our blog with resources and information for libraries. And we have a specific page for this. We are, if you are a Nebraska library and are having um, changes to your hours or being open or services you're offering, we have a form you can fill out and let us know. We're trying to keep track of that as well as we can. But we also do have a page with resources for you depending on if you are a library business looking for anything else that you need. Um, for librarians, our specific sub page here for libraries, lots of information that we've gathering. We have staff here constantly keeping on our reference department, keeping an eye on things that are out there that may be of use to libraries. So please do um, keep an eye on that if you are a Nebraska library. If you're not a Nebraska library, check your own state libraries and see if they're doing the same thing. So this morning on Encompass Live, we have with us, and I'm going to hand over to you now, Noah, I'll get your slides up. So I'm going to make you a presenter, so you should see that pop up now. Yep. And you can get your screen going. There we go. So this morning with us is Noah Lindstra. Good morning, Noah. Good morning. He has been on the show before, last fall. <laughs> um, he is a professor, professor, assistant professor at uh, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, as well as being the director of Let's Move in Libraries, great organization all about having, you know, being healthy, being movement, all those kind of active things that libraries are doing. And this morning, he's going to talk to us about how to add movement to library programming. Um, and there's a lot of fun, interesting things you can do. So I think I would just hand it over to you, Noah, to take it away and tell us how we can all do this and get more active. I think it's a problem a lot of us are having now being um, locked down on quarantine, um, not just in libraries, but at home, too. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Krista. And I just wanted to, before I get going, um, uh, if people put something in the question box, is that uh, can I can I see what they write, or is there any way for me to tell if people are commenting or writing? No, things? that's it. That only I can I can see that. Okay, well, just uh, just uh, if you do have any questions uh, throughout, um, feel free to just put it in the question box, and, and Krista, I think you'll be monitoring it. So if someone has a, a comment or question, uh, I'm more than happy to address it if it comes up. Um, I will have time for question and discussion at the end, but definitely want this to be uh, as participatory as possible. So, oh, so yes. do feel yeah, free if you have questions, uh, just put it in there. And Krista, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and say someone's asking about this, and I'm, I'll, I'll be more than happy to address it as it comes up. Um, 
I will. I'm yeah. happy to interrupt. Not a problem. <laughs> good, good. Thanks, Krista. And thanks for organizing this and inviting me. And thanks to everyone who's here. It looks like we have a little shy of 100. So I'm so really happy to um, be with you all uh, this morning. Um, and so um, and uh, I'll be going over a lot of information today. Um, and so uh, if you want to access the slides, um, they're available on my website uh, with the link is here and would definitely also invite you to get connected to us on social media, which you can get through the website and, and subscribe to our newsletter for more information about some of the things we'll be covering today. And a link um, to the slides, I'll also mention that since you're mentioning it right now, um, when we do put up the archive, I didn't mention that at the beginning, when we um, when we put up the archived uh, recording of this show, we will also have a link to the slides as well. So you'll have access to that from um, that page as well later. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just make one more quick plug. Uh, this is my new book. Uh, it's now available for order through Libraries Unlimited, Healthy Living at the Library. Um, it covers not only movement, but also food um, and food-based programming, which was the topic of my last uh, Encompass Live uh, webinar. So food and physical activity um, in particular, how to, how to embrace healthy living at, in library programming. Um, and so this, uh, just to kind of keep us on track, here's kind of what we're going to go over today. Um, we'll start with just some general questions to consider. Oh, sorry. Um, um, before we move into six program ideas, uh, we'll give you some tools that you can use now. Uh, and then I'll talk about how to enact some of these uh, ideas through partnerships that you may be able to form with the groups in your community um, or even regionally. And then we'll finish up by opening things up for an open discussion. Okay. So, but before we get into that, uh, I want to just acknowledge, of course, uh, that the time in which we're living, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and I've been closely monitoring some of the things that librarians have been doing uh, to keep themselves moving and to keep their community moving, communities moving. Um, and so this is an article I came across recently um, in Pennsylvania, when children's library assistant Laura Carson found out her family dance party at Exeter Community Library would have to be postponed, she moved it to a new space instead, her living room. Uh, and this is a, a picture of, of a library dance party, not from Pennsylvania, but actually from British Columbia, Canada. Um, they invited uh, families that participated in the library's dance party to post pictures. Um, so they made it kind of like a um, yeah, a, a dance challenge, post pictures of your dance moves of the library dance party. Um, and so it's just uh, there's lots that you can do um, virtually. Of course, uh, people are still, uh, even if we're uh, required to shelter at home, one of the exceptions is for exercise. So families are still being encouraged to exercise and be active outdoors um, as long as you practice social distancing. Uh, and in support of that effort, many libraries are joining the library or the, or the bear hunt challenge. So we're going on a bear hunt. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this book, uh, this is from Ohio. Um, and at this library in Ohio, they took it a step further and actually created printable sheets. So these are, these are coloring sheets that you can print uh, from home uh, and then color it in and write something that you're thankful for. Um, and so some they wrote, I love ebooks, my library, we love our healthcare providers in this together, Ohio. So again, ma maintaining that community uh, and encouraging movement uh, during the pandemic. Um, of course, we're all trying to encourage our community members to take advantage of our online resources. Um, but we also know that it's not healthy to be connected to technology all the time. Um, and so uh, this library in Michigan says uh, it's also important to take a, a break outside for some fresh air. Um, and they invite people to share their social distancing nature break in the comments. So again, building community, uh, encouraging people to find that balance between staying connected um, and taking a break from technology and being active outside. And just another example, this is from Arizona. Um, so the library had had planned they were going to do a, kind of um, a walk run kind of support type program. So to encourage families uh, in this small town in Arizona to do more walking um, and do it in kind of a group setting. Uh, of course, that all got canceled with COVID-19. Um, so they moved it to um, 
an online Facebook group. And so uh, family members were encouraged to kind of post pictures of their walks um, and just again, to kind of build that community and get everyone moving um, together. And let's see, uh, I think I got a message, Krista, that there's some uh, interference with the audio. I think uh, you may have to mute your mic. Um, that's all right. Um, you're sounding okay. Okay, um, I'm sounding fine. Okay, this is fine with me. I just want to. Um, sometimes so, there is issues with good webinar um, when we're also uh, with the bandwidth. Uh, okay. We have a lot of people on. Hello? I think I may have lost audio for a second. Can you still hear me? Hello, Krista? Um, well, I guess I'll just carry on and hope that uh, you all out there can hear me. I don't think there's any mechanism the way this is set up for you to indicate to uh, me that you can hear me, but um, I'm just going to assume that you can and hope for the best. Um, and so just to kind of carry on another, oh, hey, Chris, are you there? I think you got booted out for a second or something. Yep, I think I'm back now. Okay. So just I'll just continue on. All right. Yeah, let, yeah, I'm going to turn off my camera just to make sure everything is okay with my side. Okay. That looks like I'm back now, yeah. Okay, so so good. So I'm just going to gonna continue on with some technical difficulties. Um, so, uh, and, and then um, just a few more strategies that libraries are using to keep their communities moving during COVID-19. Um, this library in Massachusetts teamed up with uh, two local senior centers um, to live stream their fitness classes. So senior centers have the expertise in, in, in fitness, libraries have expertise in technology. Uh, they got together and started live streaming, um, uh, yeah, fitness classes for older adults that normally would have been offered at the senior center are now available through this partnership. Um, and then just finding fun ways to kind of encourage families to keep moving. So this library in Ireland um, posted on Facebook, uh, Library Teddy uh, doing some yoga moves. Um, uh, so just uh, even though the library is closed, kind of keep it, keeping that messaging going uh, about the importance of physical activity. Uh, so just uh, as part of this preface, so in terms of promoting physical activity during COVID-19, um, stay connected uh, to your community, to other librarians, uh, use the resources that you have available. Uh, don't do more than you can. I think it's really important to practice self-care and not think that you have to create a ton of virtual programming, but also don't feel paralyzed. Don't feel like you, you can't do anything. Um, and let's, let's get through this together. Um, so that's my little preface. Um, and so now uh, I want to go into the main topic, which is uh, just uh, how to incorporate movement into library programming in general. Um, and so we'll start with just uh, some general questions to ask yourself uh, to get yourself started in this, this type of programming. And so I think really that the first question you want to ask yourself is, does this program spark joy? Um, I think too often, uh, in our culture, when we think about physical activity and movement, um, it becomes something where it's a chore, it's strenuous, it's, it's not pleasurable. Um, we associate movement and physical activity with kind of jocks who are on the football team, who are kind of just always challenging each other to lift more, do more, um, uh, and look look a certain way. Um, and so I think we always need to ask ourselves, does what we're doing spark joy? Is it creating a culture where people feel comfortable moving, um, no matter how they look or, or who they are? Um, and, uh, and the other thing uh, is to really embrace uh, the power of play, which I'll say a little bit more about later, but this is just a picture of a, a parachute play program at a public library in Orlando, Florida. Um, and a little bit later, we'll talk about how we can all play. Um, and one of the best ways to encourage movement and physical activity is to embrace the power of play. Um, and we're also thinking about inclusion. So um, uh, there's, we can all move our bodies. There's no one, um, unless you're comatose in a coma, um, movement is good for you and you can move uh, in one way or another. Um, and so uh, there's really great resources out there about accessible uh, physical fitness. Um, and this is just one example from um, 
the Barrier Free Library Initiative at the New York Public Library, where through their Braille and Talking Book Library, they created a workshop specifically aimed at physical fitness with accessibility in mind. Um, uh, so, um, and interestingly, uh, since they serve a population of people, many of whom are homebound, um, they've actually been doing virtual programming for a while. So, um, a lot of their programs, including this one, was actually available in person as well as online. Uh, so, the Hesco Library is a great resource in general to look to in terms of how to do virtual programming, since they've always been doing virtual programming, given the audience of homebound uh, individuals that they, they typically serve. Um, also, um, when you're thinking about uh, accessibility, um, another great way to think about is how, how accessible is your library for people who may be getting to it by foot, uh, public transportation, or bicycling. Um, and so this library in St. Louis County um, did a walkability assessment. Uh, so they, in partnership with St. Louis County Human Services, they invited individuals to come participate in a one-mile guided walk to assess the safety for pedestrians of the area around the library. Um, and that, that also increases uh, inclusion and accessibility. Um, and again, like I said, movement is for everybody. Um, and there's a lot of great resources about uh, accessibility and inclusion um, put out by the federal government here in the States. Um, I would recommend in particular health.gov slash move your way as well as the CDC's uh, new Active People Healthy Nation initiative, which focuses on creating an active America together. So I think sometimes, uh, especially when I first started Let's Move In Library, sometimes people would complain that this was promoting some sort of ableist agenda, uh, which simply is not the case. Um, uh, we can all move and we all should move. Um, yeah, no, yeah. Can I jump in here quickly? Hi. All right. We did have a question and also I have a suggestion too. Um, it looks like the audio is still doing some weird things sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to suggest you turn off your camera, your webcam. Okay. Head down yep. on the gateway. But we do have a question too. Sure. That may be something you're going to be getting to, but I figured I'd ask it since it just popped up. Um, is there any research as to why libraries should be offering physical activities? At times it is questioned that is this a service that a library should even be providing? Yeah, um, and let me, uh, so I have, uh, I'm going to actually jump into, uh, I, I have it much later in the presentation. Okay, but well, I'm that's gonna, fine. If you want to just wait and get to it when you do, that's great. Yeah, you'll answer no, your question. No, that's, that's, uh, so here's the answer from the World okay. Health Organization, um, since the question has been asked. Uh, so the, according to Dr. Tidros um, Adhanam uh, Ghebreyes, who's the director general, so the, the leader of the World Health Organization, uh, he says, we must get the world moving. Increasing physical activity is not an issue that can be solved solely by the education sector or the transportation sector. Actions are needed by all sectors. So really what, what we're finding in the public health literature is that there's been over the last 20 years um, a major focus on what we can do together to get our communities moving. Um, and so the idea of kind of that this is just a responsibility of a PE teacher or a Planet Fitness, um, it's completely, it's been debunked. Uh, so, so really the, the answer is that um, if to really make a difference in terms of our physical fitness, we need multi-sectoral collaborations um, and libraries have been trusted safe institutions at the heart of their communities are perfectly positioned to do that work. Um, so I don't know if that's uh, that a be involved not just libraries everybody yep, yeah. yep everybody <laughs> everybody should be involved absolutely that's that so that would be my my answer to that question and Great. that's kind of what the science suggests um, um and so uh just uh and so piggybacking on that so actually related to that um some of you may know uh there's been a huge focus on what are called safe routes to schools uh, so ensuring that students that, that children uh can walk or bike to, or take a wheelchair to get to school. Um, and so the Safe Routes Partnership, which initially focused on, on accessibility for walking and bicycling wheelchair uh, to schools, has now expanded the Safe Routes to Parks, um, and it's now coming to libraries. So here again, uh, I think that's a perfect example of kind of um, uh, something that didn't start in libraries, but libraries are, are asked to get involved in, given, again, they're, they're, the fact that they're trusted, safe uh, institutions at the heart of every community. Um, and, and so Palo Alto uh, in California 
actually worked with the city of Palo Alto Transportation Department to create this guide um, for how to walk and roll to libraries. So they have suggested routes that are safe uh, to walk or bicycle. So people are not dependent always on driving. Uh, you can you can walk to get to your library and, and also communicating that libraries think there should be uh, accessible routes for people to be safely active outside. Um, and just another figure from the CDC, um, as part of their connecting activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations, um, you'll see over here on the right side of the screen that libraries are one of those every des everyday destinations along workplaces, home, grocery store, park, and school. Um, so again, being safe, trusted uh, locations, um, uh, libraries are being asked to step up and alongside partners work to ensure that there are ample opportunities to be physically active uh, throughout the day. Um, and just uh, one, uh, continuing on with some general questions to ask yourself, um, we do want to make sure that we check ourselves before our wreck ourselves. Um, and what we mean by that uh, is that um, uh, in any time there's physical activity involved, any time there's food involved, so whether whether you're doing a cooking class or doing a Tai Chi class, um, there is always that risk of, of injury. Um, and, and it very rarely happens. Um, but just uh, just in the spirit of protecting yourself and your library, uh, it is important to have uh, a waiver of liability form that you ask participants to sign or at least verbally consent to. And I just include two examples here in the slides. Um, but I have many more on my website. Uh, so if you go to letsmoveinlibraries.org um, and click on resources, you'll see the collection of liability forms that I've collected. Um, so just make sure uh, that, you, that people know that um, uh, the library is not liable in case of injury, which, which again, uh, based on the research I've been doing since 2016, almost never happens, um, but you do want to be safe. Um, okay, so let's go into, um, with that kind of just some general, these are questions I would, I would encourage you to ask yourself before you get started. Let's move into what, what, can, what can we actually do? Um, and really the first thing that I would recommend um, is to add movement into existing literary programs that your library offers. So you're not you're not creating new programs. You're simply adding movement to existing programs. Um, and so a perfect example of that uh, is Yoga Story Time. Uh, this is the picture they've been doing Yoga Story Times at the New Hanover County Library here in Wilmington, North Carolina, since 2009. So 11 years of Yoga Story Times with great success. Uh, it's been hugely popular. Uh, they've they've trained many of their children's services librarians to do this, um, and now uh, Katie Shear, who some of you may know, has put together the story songs and stretches curriculum uh, uh, specifically for libraries to help them encourage them to in include yoga and yoga poses into their into their story times. Um, and it's not just for children; it's not that you can do the same thing with adults uh, through a walking book club. Um, Last November, I worked with the American Library Association's Public Programs Office to do a webinar on walking programs. Um, and one of the programs that we highlighted was the Walking Book Club, uh, which Gail Borden Public Library in Elgin, Illinois, has offered um, on a weekly basis since 2009, again, with huge success. Um, and so you can go to that webinar to learn more about how this works, but briefly, um, uh, so they take a book, uh, they divide it into small chunks. So it's a small enough chunk that you could read uh, in a week, like so that because it's a week, it happens every week. Um, and so um, uh, every week, people meet at the library, go for a half hour walk together, um, and then they discuss whatever excerpt of the book they read uh, for the next half hour. Uh, because it really doesn't work to discuss the book while you're walking is what they found and others have found as well what makes the most sense is to go for a walk together then come back to the library and discuss um uh and over the years they've been able to uh, uh identify a lot of safe walking routes that they can go on that start and end at the library um and in case of the bad weather they actually have a partnership with a, a fitness center across the street that normally people have to pay to get into um but they've arranged this partnership wherein their group can actually go and walk for free uh, in the fitness center across the street on the indoor track. 
uh, during during bad weather. And I've seen other libraries that have done similar things with churches. So I know a library here in North Carolina, they're next to a big church. Um, and for their walking group, when weather is bad, they just go walking around the church, um, which is big enough to, to and, and no one's using it at the time they're doing their club. So it's a perfect partnership. So the first thing you can do is simply add movement, whether it be walking, yoga, um, whatever it is, add movement to your existing literary programs. Uh, the second thing you can do, as I said, is to embrace the spirit of play. Um, and this is uh, add games, gamification to your program. So the picture in the upper right is from Dubuque, Iowa, where they've done uh, every once a month uh, for, I think, five or six years, they do uh, a monthly after hours adult Nerf Capture the Flag program. So this is Nerf Capture the Flag for adults after hours in the library. It's been hugely, hugely popular. As you can see here, it's brought in a demographic of uh, adults, um, specifically males in their 20s, um, who many of you I'm sure know are not typically known for being avid library users. So they're bringing in um, a new demographic, they're embracing play, and they're transforming kind of how the library is perceived among a certain sector of their community. Um, and of course, we think of play for children. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, when the library did the Comic Con in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, got the kids uh, lifting the, the big dumbbells um, in a playful fashion. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about this library lanes image in the lower right in a minute. Um, but it's the idea of uh, they do an Xbox Connect uh, bowling league at this library in Brooklyn, uh, getting older adults moving and playing um, and just enjoying being together. Uh, the third thing that you could potentially do would be to develop new collections to support physical activity, um, whether it be checking out uh, passes to your local YMCA. Um, um, uh, you, some libraries actually have fitness equipment that you can check out. Um, borrowing sports equipment like footballs or, or basketballs. Um, just thinking of new collections you can develop at your library to support physical activity. And even thinking about how this could be part of our space. So this image on the right is from one of the branches of the Philadelphia Free Library where they have a climbing wall um, in their children's area. Uh, some of you who went to the Public Library Association conference uh, in February in Nashville, if you went on that library tour, you no doubt know that Nashville Public Library also has a climbing wall in their children's area. So really embracing that spirit of play, physical activity alongside books. Um, uh, the, here we see some walking treadmills at libraries in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and doing some peddling and reading uh, at a library in Texas. So thinking about how you can actually embed physical activity and movement into your physical space. Um, and a lot of things that I hear uh, librarians tell me, I'd love to do this, but I live, I have a tiny library. I don't have any space available. Well, I have an answer for that. Think about outdoors. What can you do to get people moving outdoors, uh, whether it be starting a garden space at your library like they've done in Cleveland, Ohio, in the image in the upper left, um, or working with your parks and recreation department to start a parks, uh, a story walk uh, initiative um, um, so just what can you do outside the library to encourage physical activity? And then, of course, uh, many libraries are offering fitness and exercise classes. Um, and I think I see Fran Fisher uh, is on, in the webinar. Uh, and Fran and I worked on a program called Jerry Fit at the library in which we made available um, exercise content for older adults um, at over 50 small and rural public libraries, either available by DVD or streaming media. Um, and we found it was hugely successful and you can get more information about that program um, either at jerryfit.com or my website. Um, and what we're finding is that uh, in particular for older adults, um, public libraries are becoming a safe place to exercise. Um, and, and even if your library, even if your community has, say, a Planet Fitness or a yoga studio, uh, what we're finding is that older adults typically do not feel comfortable going to these spaces. Um, and the public library is typically seen as a, as a safer place to engage in fitness and exercise. Um, 
And just going back to Nashville Public Library, they found this to be true over and over again. Um, and in the uh, annual report of the Nashville Public Library, they write for 89-year-old Dean Stevens, the free yoga class she attends weekly at the Nashville Public Library has given her a newfound stability. She says her peers are often lacking. Um, and as it says right here, last year, Be Well at Nashville Public Library delivered 1,466 classes, including yoga, Zumba, nutrition, and meditation to 18,000 Nashvillians. So it's happening in a big way um, in some of our urban libraries. It's also happening in our small and rural libraries. Um, and hopefully it can happen at your library as well. Um, and again, like I said, um, I, I really think the way to start with this is to embrace the power of play. Um, and we found this already happening in a big way for, for early literacy. So with young children, um, we all know it's important to have movements and programming for small children. Um, and this has been, so in the research backs this up. So the people who actually evaluated the American Library Association's Every Child Ready to Read at Your Library initiative concluded that librarians that were trained in the Every Child Ready to Read curriculum were much more likely to include large and small motor movement, uh, in other words, moving your body, all contributing to a fun atmosphere that encourages parents and children to play together. Well, guess what? Libraries are for all ages. Um, and if this is working well for, for small children, um, why not do it for everyone? Why not uh, just open up, open things up? Uh, so I would say one thing you could do if you're if you're thinking about how to get started doing this for adults um, is to talk to your children's services librarian. What are they doing in their story time programs that you could think about doing in your adult programming? Um, and it, uh, again, it doesn't have to be lifting weights. It's, uh, it could be something as simple as Tai Chi, gentle movements that are accessible for everyone, but can have a huge impact on the health of your community. And I think that's a method. So someone asked about kind of what messaging could you use to convince your administration? Um, I would use the methods libraries are for all ages. So if we're doing something that's impactful for one demographic, why don't we do the same thing for another demographic? Um, so if, uh, if this is so successful for young children, let's see if we can have similar success with older, older children, uh, uh, adults, older adults, um, libraries are for everyone. And we all can play. Um, so this is from uh, an after hours uh, indoor re or late night recess offered uh, at the Arlington Public Library in Virginia, where they have Twister, Nerf, uh, cookies and milk, jump rope, hula hoops, yoga, um, just really embracing kind of uh, adults need recess too. Um, and again, bringing in that that 20 uh, early 30s demographic that typically uh, don't we don't always see in our libraries. Um, in play also builds community. I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with the work of Eric Kleinenberg uh, in his book, Palaces for the People. Uh, if you read that book, uh, you may know that one of the things that Kleinenberg talks uh, quite a bit about in his book is this Library Lanes Bowling League at the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, and he actually posted a video of the Library Lanes program to his Twitter. Um, and really the message is uh, there's no better way to build community than moving your body together with other individuals, um, which is essentially what the Brooklyn Public Library does in this program. So in addition to the benefits to our individual health, um, moving together at the library builds community, which is again, what we're being asked to do more and more. And so uh, again, it doesn't have to be anything too complicated. Um, uh, going back to children, this is from the Youth Services um, uh, shout out blog uh, from the Wisconsin Library Association uh, and the librarian asks, um, have you ever finished a program and thought I needed that as much as the kids? That was my feeling after a dance party yesterday. Dancing for 30 minutes was a great stress relief. Now I'm thinking I need to add dance parties to the regular schedule and not as a special story time break. They are easy to plan. There's lots of fantastic library and curated playlists, and they help promote your music collection. And again, this could easily be done for adults. There's no reason why you couldn't have a dance party at your library for adults. Um, so open it up, think broad, uh, and let's let's dance and play in our libraries. And uh, Jay Breary is a, a good resource. I'm sure a lot of you youth services folks probably already know about this, but they have a wonderful um, 
resources you can use if you want to do uh, kind of a dance party story uh, program. Uh, and there's a lot of similar resources for um, adults. Um, and one I once wanted to mention, free, people often ask me about copyright concerns. Um, and so you, if you don't know, Vimeo, uh, so Vimeo is a tool similar to YouTube. Um, and you can actually search Vimeo by creative con content licenses, or creative commons license content. So if you search Vimeo uh, and, and buy a creative commons license, you can actually find um, videos that you can stream uh, in your libraries um, without having to worry about copyright uh, or licensing. So here's uh, just a dance video that you could, uh, if you wanted to, you could be sharing on your Facebook tomorrow. Um, and once things return to normal, you could be uh, broadcasting to do uh, a free dance program at your library. That's an awesome tip. That is one thing a lot of people are very concerned about copyright in general, and especially with music, it's something that's so, people get caught by that um, all the time by surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Vimeo is a great place for video, uh, but there's a lot of, there's a number of kind of aggregators of Creative Commons music as well. So you can, mm -hmm. you can find that. So if you just search Creative Commons music search, there's a number mm -hmm. of search engines that will enable you to find um, um, music resources that are, are, have been released such that you could uh, share them widely and use for your library dance party or what have you. Um, there's also a number of resources that have, have been put together by our federal government here in the States that are completely open access. Um, so Go for Life, an um, uh, initiative of the National Institute on Aging, they've created these, uh, these sample workout videos um, that uh, there's no restrictions on youth. Uh, so you could, if you wanna, if you wanna do a 15 minute uh, workout for older adults, um, you could just play this video um, and there's no restrictions. Um, and in fact, I know a number of libraries are actually using Go For Life content for exercise programs for older adults. Um, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, they've been using Go For Life content for I think five or six years. Um, they do it once a week uh, on, I think it's usually Friday at 10 or 11, um, and they have um, a steady crowd of people that come to work out at the library along with this content, which is uh, evidence-based and from the federal government and completely free to use. Uh, the other thing you can do, so I mentioned about space uh, earlier, um, and again, so you can incorporate physical activity into your space. Um, so this is actually from a university, uh, but at Walsh University in Ohio, uh, they actually collaborated with the university wellness um, department to uh, develop um, these, uh, these guides to uh, simple exercises you can do in your library. Um, and they laminated these uh, and they put them on the end of bookshelves. Um, they put them on tables and they just made them available. So this is just one of their, so how to do a lunge, so how to get up and, and just get up from your desk for a minute, take a, take a break to move a little bit. Um, and so just thinking about how you could put up uh, in, in your library, kind of incorporated into the space, kind of reminders of the importance of periodically getting up from your table and just moving a little bit and, and how that can really help you uh, in your health and just your mental well-being. Um, and again, I, I think uh, uh, one of the things that I've been really finding in my research is that the librarians that are really doing this most effectively are librarians who also make it a priority to take care of themselves. Um, and so the health of ourselves, so the more that we take care of ourselves, the more um, capable and confident we will be in terms of offering uh, these resources to our community members. Um, and so I just want to make a, a, a recommendation that you check out the resources of my colleague and friend, uh, Jen Carson, who's a library director in New Brunswick, uh, Canada. Uh, she put, has put together an amazing array of resources about how to embrace self-care uh, among library workers. Um, and given that she's a yoga instructor, a Taekwondo instructor, and just a, an avid uh, advocate for physical activity, um, a lot of her recommendations just focus on how you as a library worker can incorporate movement um, into your daily routines. Um, and just another great resource uh, that I wanna plug is this instant resource, uh, Get Moving at the Library, which was put together through uh, a collaboration between the Los Angeles Public Library and the UCLA School of Public Health. Um, and so this is a free video you can watch to learn more. Um, 
uh, but essentially it focuses on kind of taking 10 minutes um, uh, break uh, throughout the day to just move and they have structured kind of 10 minute activity breaks um, that you can use to kind of both as library staff get people moving, but you could do it um, uh, in a community too. So you could set, so if you have your book club, so let's say you have a 60 minute book club, um, halfway through that 60 minutes, uh, you could say, all right, it's time for instant recess. We're gonna get up and do these simple things that don't require a lot of space. Uh, you just push back your chair and do instant recess. Um, everyone gets energized, uh, gets a little bit movement in, and then you go back to discussing the book. Um, or whatever, whatever it may be, but this this idea of having 10 minute uh, physical activity breaks uh, throughout the day um, uh, through this kind of um, framework of instant recess. And so the, I already included this slide again, so there was a question, why libraries? Um, and again, the answer is um, everyone is being asked to do this. Um, this is not about libraries stepping into a new role. This is about libraries being part of communities. Um, and part of the the response to this public health crisis, um, it's been we've it's been the World Health Organization says that we are living in a pandemic of physical inactivity. Um, uh, obesity rates are soaring. Uh, type two diabetes is soaring. Um, all the heart problems associated with uh, with our sedentary lifestyles are leading to an enormous public health crisis. Um, we're, we're familiar with kind of fast moving public health crises like COVID-19 or the opioid epidemic. Um, this is a more slow moving, but no less uh, devastating public health crisis. Um, and since libraries are responsive to community needs, um, we are being asked to step in and help out along with everyone else. And the good thing about that is since, uh, since so many different sectors are, are trying to work on this, uh, there's a huge opportunity to partner with others in your community to make this happen. So I mentioned uh, the National Institute on Aging, they've released a toolkit um, that, about how uh, entities like senior centers and others can partner with public libraries to offer exercise activities for older adults. Um, uh, and really, I would say uh, a, a great way to get started is to reach out to partners. Um, and in my research, the three most common partners I've seen are Parks and Recreation, the Cooperative Extension, and the Public Health Department. So one, I, I would say reaching out to one of those three entities would be a great way to get started. Um, and again, really thinking creatively about how, how, how your space, your library space could be used. Um, so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they actually released a video called um, Fun and Fitness in a Library Parking Lot, um, talking about how in Monterey Park, California, um, the library actually um, allowed a local fitness group to use part of their parking lot um, for their weekly fitness routine. Um, in Southern California, it can get quite hot, uh, so community members needed a shaded place to do it. Um, the parking lot was had space available. And so thus, Fun and Fitness in a Library Parking Lot was born. So just being open to and excited about these unconventional uh, partnerships that you could do to um, increase physical activity and movement in your community. Um, and again, uh, take it outside. So just uh, this is the Nature Walk Book Club in Orlando, Florida. Um, they call Books in Motion. Um, they just go go to a park and walk, uh, and then discuss the book at at a pavilion after after walking around the park. Uh, so partner up. So we're getting towards the end. Uh, so I just want to recommend uh, after this webinar is over, talk to a colleague about one thing uh, you may want to try to do. Um, and so that that'll build accountability. I've given you a ton of information, so I'd encourage you to, to verbally tell a colleague. Um, uh, here's one thing I want to try doing. Um, uh, so that you've kind of committed to trying something new um, and ask them how you can work together to make it happen. Um, and one of the most exciting things that I've seen in my research is libraries actually working together. So this is uh, at the Grand Prairie, Prairie Public Library. This is a library in Alberta, Canada. They actually partnered with a library in Oklahoma that they found was exactly um, uh, 2,000 uh, in 20 kilometers um, or 2020 miles. Um, so since we're in 2020, um, uh, let's let's walk 2020 miles together. So encouraging people to uh, track uh, their mileage. So they're kind of collectively walking the distance so that, that you can virtually 
uh, travel from Grand Prairie, Alberta to Tulsa, Oklahoma and back again. So thinking about how you can work with, with other libraries to make this happen. And if you want to learn more, there's there's never been more resources on this topic. Uh, I mentioned Jen Carson has written a book uh, on it. Uh, I've written a book on this. Uh, Katie Shear, who I mentioned, has written a book. Um, so there's lots of books, there's lots of resources, so, so take advantage of them. Um, and next steps, join us. Um, we do a monthly newsletter, we're on social media. I've been aggregating uh, some of the virtual programs that libraries have been doing on my YouTube channel. So I have a YouTube playlist. Um, of yoga, balance, um, different virtual programs, libraries are offered. So share what you're doing. So don't just uh, join our newsletter, uh, actually share back um, and, and we will in turn broadcast your successes, uh, try something new. Don't do it alone. Um, and if you're struggling, ask for help. Ask for help from partners uh, in your community, from community members themselves, and simply from other librarians. Um, and just to end with the story of success, uh, one of these are two of our advisory board members uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, uh, and so they were actually, they got the mayor of Atlanta, uh, Keisha Lane Bottoms, uh, to pose with them in front of a Let's Move In Libraries banner um, at the kickoff to their summer programming in May of 2019. So dream big and big things will happen. And so thank you for your time. And uh, I'm now uh, looking forward to your questions. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely reach out to whoever. You never know. <laughs> um, okay, we do have a bunch of uh, some questions and comments that did come out in uh, throughout your talk. Uh, we'll start with the bottom one here because it's a um, you know by practice. Um, so I want to know who did you recommend to partner with? Um, they got Public Health and Parks and Rec. Was there other? Yeah, so the third most common partner I've seen is uh, so it's it's the Cooperative Extension. So this is part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and and it's different in every but every every state has a land grant uh, university, and as part of that land grant university, uh, they have county extension agents, um, and those county extension agents are charged to increase uh, health. Um, in their communities, and they frequently do through do so through uh, nutrition and often physical activity programming. Um, and so, Cooperative Extension was the third uh, partner that I recommended. Yeah, we have that here in Nebraska. It, it's like you said through the land grant university, so it's through our University of Nebraska system. And so here you would look for like Nebraska Extension mm -hmm. is what you're going to find. So um, yeah, look for the same kind of thing in your states. Like you said, they're going to be possibly called something else but yeah they do great programming and ours here in Nebraska at least have um, historically worked with libraries and lots of different types of programs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they may already be out there wanting to do things um, with you like I know some of them are we um, do their own uh, summer reading program programming so working with them on doing something group wide together would be um, cool too um, let's see what we got here from other questions. Oh, we have a couple of questions, which I think you did, <clears throat> excuse me, mentioned earlier um, about getting a waiver. Uh, mm -hmm. What about liability with the climbing wall? This is when you have that picture of climbing wall. Um, does every parent sign a waiver before children are allowed on it? That was that would be the. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, so I'll I'll offer so, uh, and I know how how they do it in Nashville, um, because I actually visited their climbing wall in Nashville, um, and I have a picture of this that I'd be happy to share with whoever. So, if you email me, I can send you what they actually have posted. But mm -hmm. next to the climbing wall, they actually have posted. Here's the rules of the climbing wall, and and one of the one of the things that it says is that you use it at your own risk. Um, so since it is a a, a space. Uh, permanently part of the library they just have posted next to it kind of um, and whether or not people read it um, you, you can never be sure but they do have it posted like let it be known you use it at your own risk um, and so that's what they do at Nashville and, and I imagine they probably do the same in Philadelphia okay because you did say earlier there was you did have some examples of waivers that you could use if you're doing something yep else. I mean so you could do it both ways I suppose either have them sign something or at least have it posted and sometimes just posting is enough. So I think in Richland Library in Columbia, South Carolina, they have just a posted sign when you enter the building, um, not about physical activity, but about how you agree by entering the space uh, to be photographed. Um, 
Yeah. Mm. So they, they just, as opposed to having every single person sign a photo photograph waiver, they just have a blanket, like you enter the building, it says you may be photographed, uh, just let it be known. So uh, you don't always need people's signature, sometimes just um, ensuring that there's some mechanism to, that they know they're doing this uh, at their own risk uh, is sufficient. Right. Um, so then, yeah, one of the, uh, someone else was asking about recommending, a, would you recommend a waiver for programs for young kids like the dance party? I mean, it's, I guess it would. It would depend. And so actually, I mean, a lot of libraries have actually told me they don't have waivers. And it's precisely because, uh, so we've been doing, so, I mean, it, it is interesting, like, um, when you think about, so it is kind of a, it's a paradox in a way, like, uh, on the one hand, like, um, no one ever gets concerned about like having young kids move around and dance around. It's only it's only concerning when you have adults move around. Um, <laughs> True. So some, li some libraries have actually said like we we consulted with our insurance company and you know we're already doing dance programs for kids um, and those are covered by our existing policy. We can do the same thing for adults and we don't need any waivers. So some libraries have actually moved away from waivers because uh, they're already doing it for kids and yeah. and no. So I think it really depends on your jurisdiction. You'd probably want to talk to your insurance company to see what types of coverage you have. Sure, you may already have this covered, and it's not something yep. you need to do some extra work for you. I think some of the concern with you know the difference between kids and adults may be you know as us adults, um, kids heal faster than us as we get older. <laughs> mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, talking about uh, uh, cooperating, uh, one of our librarians here was a formerly director at one of our libraries here in Genoa in Nebraska said that, that she had an elementary PE teacher help mm -hmm. with the screening mm -hmm. program a few years ago and she offered great movement games. So working yeah. with your um, local elementary high school, your K-12 would be an option, a uh, uh, um, suggestion too. That's great, Tammy. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, and I love that suggestion. Um, and I've heard the same thing from Kansas. So um, uh, a Kansas librarian, as part of her summer reading, she has Fitness Thursdays, uh, where she invites a retired PE teacher, comes down during the summer every Thursday and does fitness games with the kids. Uh, so yeah, I think PE teachers, uh, both current mm -hmm. and former, are great, great resources to tap into as well. I think that might help too with people. I mean, as a librarian, you don't have the training for mm -hmm. physical stuff maybe, but a PE teacher, that's their job. They would know the right things to do, the appropriate things for different ages, uh, safety and whatnot, how to train, how to teach the different things. Yeah, if you're worried yeah. about how to run one of these things, get someone who does. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree with that, and and I do think certainly when you get into more advanced things, uh, it is important to bring people in. But I also think like we all know how to move our bodies. Uh, we all know how to dance and get out the wiggles um, and go for a walk. Uh, and so I mean, there's there's things, and again, not everyone. There is some people that are not, but the vast majority of us can can do things, and and it, you don't always need to hire a yoga instructor to start doing movement programs at your library. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we do have another thank you for the tips about the streaming music and other unrestricted videos. Like I said earlier, that was great, definitely. Uh, so someone else saying, yes, thanks so much for that. Um, and then here's some other examples of things. Uh, someone who was asking about, uh, oh, and you had mentioned this, creating semi-permanent outdoor spaces for the purpose mm -hmm. of moving activities. And they said in their library, um, they are planning a story walk in a small mm -hmm. field next door to our branch. So, you know, work out with your community. Uh, is there somewhere we can do this in a park or an area that already exists that isn't necessarily owned by the library? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And she says the friends of the library are an integral part in creating the garden and participating in the program. Great. Yeah, yeah. I think friends are great, uh, great allies, supporters uh, for this. Um, I mean, Parks and Recreation is a common partner for these initiatives um, mm -hmm. since they have that expertise in maintaining outdoor spaces. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of libraries. There's a lot of greenways and, and rails to trails going up across the country. So libraries are working with greenways um, and rails to trails programs to have story walks along greenways and new trails that are emerging. Um, there's lots of, lots of opportunities um, that you can do mm -hmm. in partnership with others. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, and someone here says we have a story walk at the county park. Great partnership in their fifth year of doing mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, yeah, that's great. And and what I would say with the story walk is I often people people love the idea of a story walk. I would say um, what what really works the best from what I've seen is that you you have a partnership where you as a librarian are responsible for uh, rotating the stories, uh, maybe on a quarterly basis, um, and doing a kickoff uh, program. Hey, we got a new story up. Let's have a kickoff celebration. And yeah. then the people from Parks and Recreation they handle all the physical maintenance of the of the installation. Um, including if, if there's been some water damage and just checking on the, and that's, that's a partnership that's worked really well. Parks and Recreation people, they love kind of being responsible for physical things outdoors. That's, that's what they do. Um, and so that, 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 that partnership model I've seen over and over again be really successful. And nobody's asked about this, because, but um, I'll mention it anyways, as you're wondering about story walks, we've done a couple of shows on Encompass Live about them. So if you want to know how other places have done it, you can go into our archives to look at that. And also you can just look online. There's the story walk, walk lots of information about other libraries doing this and how they've um, done it in their uh, communities. Um, but it's an awesome combo, I think, of, of reading and walking as you go. Yeah, and the, and the possibilities are endless. Uh, I mean, I think initially, um, and most story walks are focused on storybook for children, but I've seen libraries that have done poetry um, that are more geared towards adults. Um, I mean, it's not like our rated content, but the reading level is a little bit higher. Um, mm -hmm. Libraries have done history walks, so they're posting information about local history. Um, so certainly you can do this as kind of a children's storybook, but once you get a story walk installation up, you can put whatever you want into it. Um, so yeah, it doesn't always have to be children's content. I remember, now that you mentioned that, I'm remembering, I think last year we had one here in Lincoln, Nebraska that was, um, oh, it was associated with a Nebraska author. It might have been a Willa Cather book or something. Different chapters of the book were posted in windows in the different businesses mm -hmm. and organizations down downtown, and you would walk from one to another reading the story as it went. And so it was you know, more adult things. So you'd stand a little bit longer, but just a few pages at each place. Um, so, yeah, you can, definitely doesn't have to just be kids' stories. Yeah, yeah, and I love that. Yeah, and I know we're running out of time, but yeah, you can also do a downtown business story walk as well, which Krista yeah. mentioned, and I've seen lots of libraries do that uh, kind of, I mean, downtowns we know are kind of struggling in a lot of places, um, mm -hmm. and so oftentimes downtown businesses are more than happy to allow you to post uh, some pages in their window and because they're, they, it's, that's building their business, and, and you're doing it not just in one business, but in all the businesses, so it's yeah. a great way to support downtown and Main Street revitalization by, by working with local businesses to have story walks and, and the windows. And you mentioned poetry. That's a good, right now, April is Poetry Month, National Poetry Month. It'd be part, and that's, those are short, sometimes shorter things that people can read you know, quickly in a different each window. So, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, it is just a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. Um, 11 o'clock Central Time. We will go as long as it takes for everybody to get your questions asked and to... Um, Anything else Noah wants to wrap up with? So if you do have any other questions, last minute questions you want to ask, get them typed in the questions section. Um, but I do have one here right now. Um, someone wants to know if there are any grants or something similar out there available for libraries to assist with creating fitness programming. Yeah, so um, I think there's there's two uh, main sources of funding, um, and so I, it's going to depend on your jurisdiction. Uh, so the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, um, oh. every every state, uh, so you 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 whether you know it or not, you're you're served by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Um, uh, but in the in the greater Midwest region, they're actually doing a project right now where they're making Fitbits available for libraries to use for programming. So a lot of libraries that, that are participating in this Fitbit project um, are actually using them to encourage physical activity and movement. I mean, that's what a Fitbit is for. Um, so the National Network of Libraries of Medicine may have funding depending on where you're at. Um, uh, state libraries are increasingly supporting this. So I know here in North Carolina, um, uh, for the first time ever, the state library um, had uh, their LSTA funding. They had a, a, a dedicated funding stream for health-related programming. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of the libraries that applied actually used that LSTA money for uh, movement-related programming. So one of our libraries actually applied for a grant, which was funded, um, which they used to actually work with a local bicycle shop to make bicycles available for checkout at the library. Um, since the library is right along a new greenway that was recently established. So encouraging people to go out and bike on the greenway by having bikes available for checkout. Um, mm -hmm. So your state library, their LSTA funding, the National Networks of Libraries of Medicine, 
again, it's going to depend on your specific jurisdiction. Uh, if you want to send me an email, I can try to uh, identify resources um, specific to your area, but I would say state libraries and the NNLM are probably your best bets in terms of funding. Yeah, I can definitely say for here in Nebraska, because I'm my department, library development, is one that handles our grants. Uh, we would definitely um, do that. We don't have anything that we don't usually specify that grants are for a particular purpose that's that focus. Um, but we have um, youth grants for excellence that anything related to kids would be um, children and um, teens would be appropriate. That would be appropriate for to apply for, and. Um, the library we've got continuing education grants that would be more for your um, staff if they wanted to attend or learn how to do something um, they could use that and then our um, uh, we have internship grants some if you wanted to have an intern that would run one of these programs we would definitely approve that so definitely look to your state library and see if they are what what they're offering and you can then fit whatever you want to do into that so um, like I said we don't specifically say we're doing it you know like what you said that some places are saying really pushing the, the um, movement part of it, but we would definitely look at those grants and most likely approve them. They're well-written ones, yeah. Um, oh, and here's another suggestion. Libraries can also apply through their area agency on aging mm, yeah. yep. um, for title, title 3D OAA funding for evidence-based programs. So for the older, um, your older patrons. Yeah, so thanks. And I'm guessing that must be Fran Fisher who wrote that. And, it uh, is, yeah. yes, it was Fran. <laughs> so Fran, yeah, that's a great point. And Fran, uh, I know Fran, I apologies for not mentioning it, but I mentioned Jerry Fett. Um, so Jerry Fett is one of those evidence-based programs. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, yeah, area agencies on aging. I know um, I'm actually doing a small study of, of, and I found here in North Carolina, our state area agency on aging have done uh, movement-based programs for older adults. Um, in over 25 public libraries throughout the state um, already. Um, and so the area agencies on aging are always looking for uh, spaces to offer physical activity programs for older adults. Um, and especially in small and rural communities, those spaces uh, inevitably are the public libraries because in many places there is no senior center or the senior center has such limited hours that they can't do anything. Sure, sure. All right, those are great suggestions, definitely. All right, so that is all of the comments and questions I had for the moment. Uh, if you have any last minute things you want to ask of Noah or recommend or suggest, get it typed in right now while we are wrapping up. We can do that. Um, anything anything last minute, last you want to say, Noah, to wrap up your presentation? No, just uh, just stay connected. I mean, uh, everything that I do is dependent upon kind of uh, information that librarians uh, share with me. So just let me know what you're doing. Share with me how things are going. Um, I want to be connected with you all, and and please uh, so stay connected. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Um, oh, and one more re recommendation. I should have thought about this because I just had was able to join, whether I wanted to or not. AARP. They yeah. offer th great things. I wonder if you could partner. They just wondering if anyone you could look at them to partner with for programs as well. Yeah, so absolutely. And I'll just make a quick plug. So AARP, they actually have one of the best walk audit tools uh, out there. So if you want to do all, so I mentioned that walkability program that St. Louis did. Um, uh, so if you just type in walk audit AARP. They have a ton of information that you could quickly use to do a walkability program. So help, yeah, get people together and then go see how accessible your library is for pedestrians. Uh, but that's an AARP resource that I would highly recommend. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Oh, oh, hello. Okay. Christian Minter is on. She is actually our um, National Network Libraries of Medicine great, great. and Continental Region person. Um, we know her. Hi, Christian. Um, that says they are currently offering funding for public libraries and K-12 partnerships. Oh, great. Um, great. Uh, and the deadline is April 30th. So if you are part in the mid-continental region, Nebraska is part of that. If you look for the network, National Network of Libraries of Medicine, NNLM. Um, look online for their website, and there are different regions that cover multiple states. Um, so I know our, she's saying our mid-continental one does have a current funding out. I'm going to look for that, Christian, and get that posted out to our our people here. But yeah, look for your local ones too, and see your regional ones, see if they are actually um, doing this, something similar. Yeah. Lots of great ideas and tips.
all right. So I think we'll work on wrapping this up for today. Um, Thank you so much, Noah. I'm glad we we're able to get you on the show and you're able to still do it, uh, considering the difficult times we're in right now. Um, as I said at the beginning, we are an online show. As long as I can get somewhere with internet connection and a presenter can get somewhere, whether it's home, work, wherever, we will continue um, with our with our Encompass Live. Great. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity, Krista. Yeah. So we have it's just some comments saying thanks for your time. Best workshop with so much information. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, and so there's a question, will the attendees' contributions be available after today's webinar? Um, if you're talking about the comments or anything, I mean, it's just going to be in the recording. So when this recording is available, anything, I've read everything that everybody typed in. Well, except for your, all of your telling me that you couldn't hear me talking earlier. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> um, and I will mention that now, since we did have some audio issues with the live show at the beginning, when uh, potentially we had too many things going on at the same time, bandwidth-wise, um, experience shows that usually our recordings come out with everything, even though we at our end, even mine or Noah's end, may have had our own personal difficulties, and you may have at your end had bandwidth or internet connection difficulties. Um, the recording usually captures it all. So hopefully we will have anything you miss will be available in that. Um, and so I'm going to pull a presenter control to my screen right now and actually talk right. to you about that as we wrap up. Thank you so much, Noah. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, this is great. Um, I've got some ideas of things that I want to do, that ARP walk uh, test. And definitely, as I am working from home mostly, I am discovering I'm doing a lot more sitting than I used to when I work at, at my office. So I need to get more of these things on my agenda. <laughs> um, so thank you for all those tips from Noah and everyone else on the line. So that will be um, for today's show. This is our Encompass Live website. If you do Google just Encompass Live or use your search engine of choice, we are the only thing called that so far on the internet. Nobody's allowed to use that name. <laughs> um, and you will find our webpage. These are our upcoming shows here. Well, today's show and our upcoming ones that we have on the schedule. This is where our archives are. This link right underneath our upcoming shows will give you our archives. Uh, the most recent ones at the top of the list. So hopefully by the end of the day today, as long as YouTube and GoToWebinar cooperate with me, I'll have it posted here. I'll announce it and let all you guys know that it was available. We'll have a link to the recording, a link to the Let's Move in Libraries website, and um, to the presentation slides will be available there. And while I'm here, I'll also show you, we do have a search feature for our archives. You can search our entire archives or just the most recent 12 months. Uh, this is because this we are in... We started Encompass Live in January 2009, and we've been doing a weekly show almost every week since then. So we have a lot of archives here, and we have our full show archives going back to the very beginning. I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom for you, but this is everything. So do pay attention when you are doing the search on here to the original broadcast date. Some things may be, uh, some things will be always be eternal, book re review lists, how to do certain programs, uh, but some things may be expired or outdated. Some services or programs might not exist anymore. Some links might not work anymore. As time has gone on, we don't always, we don't go back and check all of these hundreds and hundreds of archives. Um, but do pay attention to that when you are um, searching for anything on here, um, if you do go back very far, or you can just limit it to the just the most recent 12 months worth and you know you'll have current uh, information. So just be aware of that when you are using our archives. Uh, we do also have a Facebook page. I have links to that in all of our different pages here, but I've got to open over here. If you do like to use Facebook, you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. You'll get notifications of when our shows are available. Here's a reminder to log into this morning's show, when our recordings are available, and anything new we've added. Reminders of the upcoming shows are on here, so um, do keep an eye on there. If you'd like to, a couple times a week, you'll get notifications through our Encompass Live page. Um, next week, our show will be something else that might be very useful to people since we are not necessarily doing in-person things. Amplified advisory with video book talks. So uh, doing readers advisory and doing via video. Sam Helmick, who's um, from next door to us here, next door to Nebraska, <laughs> um, Burlington, Iowa uh, Public Library with us, and she will be talking about how to do these video book talks. So do sign up for that one. Um, you notice I only have two shows here on the schedule at the moment officially. I am working with, I'm in conversation with some people about getting on the schedule. It's, uh, so you will see more things added here. I, as I said, I am dedicated to having a show every week and I'm just now in conversations with some more people to get more things on here. So keep an eye on here to see when that other April date and our future dates get filled up as well. 
Um, someone has a question about CE guidelines. Oh, continuing education. We do, um, here in Nebraska, we have a continuing education program. If you're a Nebraska library and you attend our sessions, I automatically send that on to our CE people and uh, our continuing education people, and they will add that. If you're not and you attended this live show, you will get an email in about an hour automatically sent to you from GoToWebinar saying, thank you for attending today's show, and this serves as your proof of attending, and it will have a certificate attached to that, a PDF certificate that you can use if you need to use that to submit to whoever does your continuing education um, in your state. So look for that. Other than that, that uh, wraps it up for today. Thank you, everybody, for being with us this morning. Thank you very much, Noah, for being here with me. And hopefully we'll see you another time on Encompass Live. Great. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.